You can be seated. I don't know why I just had you sit down, because in about two seconds, I'm going to have you stand <laughs> yet again. Everybody doing all right? Yeah. You know what? We're going to do a little song that the Lord gave me recently. Actually, he gave me part of it a long time ago, but is this on? Testing. Just recently, uh, just uh, finished it somehow. And um, everybody say hey to your neighbor for a minute. Praise God. Well, my wife, Pastor Melissa, sends her love. She wanted to be here. And uh, we have a women's conference in our region next week. And so she didn't feel like she could come. But I'm planning to be back here in December for birthday of a king. And she'll come with me. But she wanted me to be sure that she uh, got the love on everybody here. It's just great to be with, with King's family. Uh, we're just one church in many locations all over the world, amen? And it's great to see Dr. Joe and Denise. They're actually from our area. Dr. Joe has acted in our shows and taught at our KSM, and we're just so, so cool to get to see you guys up here. And it's also good to be with my blood family. I don't know if you know, but Pastor Kirsten is my nephew. He is my, my brother's son, and Pastor Kimmy and all the fam. Give them a hand, they're such a blessing. But why don't you go ahead and stand back up and we're gonna worship together for just a moment. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah. 
how about one more shout to the Lord? Here we go. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, open with me in a second. Samuel chapter 6. And just stay standing for a moment. Second Samuel chapter 6. Have a word, I believe, for the, from the Lord for us tonight. We're going to read verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read from the NIV, the 1984 yes. NIV, because it's my favorite. All right? I'll give you just a second more. Hallelujah. All right. 2 Samuel 6, 1 and 2. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bela of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. Let's all pray together. God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for what you've already done in this place, how people have worshiped, people have entered in, people have been healed, people have been prayed for. We've prayed, we've sought you, we've rejoiced. Lord, right now as we break open your word, I pray that you would say what you want to say to our hearts. We open our hearts, God, to what you want to speak to us and the change and the transformation you want to bring in our lives through renewing of our minds. Lord God, so touch us tonight and help me share it as I should. In your mighty name, we all said amen. You can be seated. Man, I just counted a privilege to be with you guys tonight. Anytime that I get the opportunity to speak or share here at King's Wasilla, I've said this before, but except for, I think, Oahu, where I used to go every single week for, for many years, I have been to King's Alaska Wasilla more than any extension in all of KC over the years. So I love it here, especially this time of year. I love the rain. I love the fall-ish weather. And um, I mean, I'm just loving being around here. And on top of that, we just love Pastor Daniel and Karen and their family. They are like family to us. And uh, he's my brother. And um, uh, Pastor Daniel, it's just my privilege that I was ever there for any of that. And it's only God, you know? I mean, it's just crazy to me. So praise God. And I do remember Teen Challenge. This morning, we listened to Jim LaFoon. How many of you were here and you heard that word? I just want to see how many are here that heard that. And he talked about how we needed to begin to rise up to pray, but he also mentioned something about how we needed to rise up and worship. And he mentioned a scripture from the word of God about how we should speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, both corporately and personally. He mentioned it in prayer, he mentioned it about worship, and tonight we're gonna talk about that. What we just sang, we're gonna talk about. The title of this message is what we just sang. It's called Bring in the Praise. Bring in the praise in our hearts, our home, our church, our atmosphere, and the world. And David was a man who really brought in the praise to Israel. Before David, praise had not had a huge large role in Israel for some time. Things had been pretty dark. The presence of God had not played a large role. You had the period of the judges where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It sounds a lot like the age we live in. Isn't that right? And then there was the time of Samuel, who was a great man. But during that time, the ark, which is where the presence of God was. It represented the presence of God. That's where the presence of God was enthroned on the earth, which we just read a moment ago, but it had been taken and stolen by the Philistines. Is there any way to get a little bit more of this mic somehow up here? It would help me out uh, if we could somehow, okay? But it had been stolen. And then, I'm not gonna tell the whole story, it came back to Israel, and it ended up a man named Abinadab's house, and it was there for around 40 years, the ark of God just in somebody's house for 40 years. And then Saul became king, and in his entire reign, he didn't go after it. In his entire reign, he didn't hunger for God. He didn't hunger for the presence of God. Now listen, he was king. He could have done whatever he wanted, and the place where the presence of God dwelt was in his nation, and he never even bothered to visit or go find out about it. Instead, he was satisfied just to get secondhand knowledge of God, 
from the prophet Samuel. But then David becomes king over the whole nation and everything changes. And in the chapter that we read, 2 Samuel chapter six, I'm gonna share six things. Everybody say six things. 2 Samuel six, we're gonna share six things that David did to bring in the praise to the nation of Israel. And I'm actually gonna walk you through this chapter a little bit tonight. And the first thing he did was he made going after God's presence priority. He made it what? Prior. Now listen, therefore, he made praise priority. You say, well, why is that? Well, I think we probably all know this verse. We enter his gates with? Come on, we enter his gates with? We enter his courts with? Right. So if you're going to go after God, you have to make praise a priority because that's the thing that opens the gates to it. When we come in here, we're not messing around. We're coming to bring the praise into the house of God, amen? And so David takes 30,000 soldiers with him. And he had some, some bad soldiers. He takes 30,000 soldiers, and it said the entire house of Israel. It's like the nation, and he said, we are going to Kiriath Jerem. We are going to Abinadab's house. We are going to bring back that ark. We are going to bring God's presence back into the forefront of our nation. It's not going to sit there anymore, ignored, forgotten, stolen, misused. As long as I'm king, it's going to be priority. It reminds me of what he wrote in Psalms 27, 4. One thing have I desired, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. In other words, he's saying, it's my one thing. It's my top thing. It's my number one. It's priority. So David becomes king, and one of the first things he does is he says, we're going after God. It's priority. Number two, second verse, I read it a minute ago. It said, he and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name. He set out to bring up. Can you say that with me? He what? He set out to bring up. In other words, he had purpose. We're not, we're not just going up there like, well, I hope we can get it. We're going to knock on Abinadab's door, and if he'll let us in, we might get the ark. We're going to cruise up there, stop off, get some snacks, on the way, if it works out, that is not, when you set out to do something, I mean, and you're serious about it, you have your heart set on it. You are fixed on it. It's not just, I hope this turns out, it's like we are going to do this. And the Hebrew word right there for, for that, that section set out is this, it means this, arise, to come on the scene, to persist, to be fixed on, even arise in a hostile manner, like, like you're going to do it no matter what, to stir up, to give effect to. So here's David. Man, he, he's just newly king, and he's got all of his men, and they're rising up, if you will. They're coming on the scene in strength to stir things up, to persist, to be fixed on going after the presence of God and ushering in the presence of God. Come on. Do we come to God like that? Do we come to God in our private time like that? When we walk in this building, do we come to God like that? When we go to a life group, do we come to God like that? Like, 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 man, I'm a worshiper. I am coming with determination. I am going to arise with strength to go after God. Not, not just casually show up, nice song, Minister Micah. Cool verse, love that bridge. I'm gonna sway. What did you say? Go to the left. Or just stare. And we stare to the right, and we stare to the... Some of you thought that was the verse. I'm guessing. I don't know. I was not up here. You saw it? That is not the words, all right? No. We come with purpose. Church, listen, please. We should come with purpose. I'm going to go after God. Come with the heart of David. I'm going to go after him with all I've got. I'm going to usher in the presence of God. I'm setting out to bring in the praise of God in this place. 
You know, sometimes we can come to church and, or life group or wherever we show up and we're just here to receive. It's all about us. What can I get? What are they going to say? Am I going to like it or not? Do I like the song? If I like it, I might clap. If I like the sermon, I might give a little bit. Sometimes we can come uh, with that attitude, but we've got to come to be here to pour out with a purpose, not just to drink in, to pour out. Everybody say, pour out. And and a verse that that really I've always loved as, as a worship leader is Psalm 68, 24 and 25. It says, your procession, God, has come into view. The procession of my God and King into the sanctuary. In front are the singers, after them the musicians, with them are the young women playing timbrels. You say, what, what's so great about that verse? God has a procession that he wants to bring into the sanctuary. And it's saying how it enters is through our praise. It's saying right there, it said, the singers, the musicians, the young women playing timbrels, that means the dancers. All that saying is, is the praise ushers that in. And he wants to bring that procession in this place in a greater way. And he wants to bring it in your life group in a greater way. And he wants to bring it in your home in a greater way. And he wants to bring it in the sanctuary of your heart in a greater way. Come on. The king wants to enter in, in all his glory, and all his power. Will we be the ones who usher him in? Three is this. David was prepared. I'm using lots of P words tonight. He was prepared, he made plans. He had a place, he pitched a tent. They're just flowing tonight. The parallel to this chapter is in 1 Chronicles 15. It says, after David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared, everybody say prepared, prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Before he ever took those 30,000 guys, before he ever drew the nation and said, we're going to kiriath Jerem to get the ark, he had already prepared a place for it. He had already cleared the land. He had already pitched a tent. When I get this ark, I have a place for it to go. He was ready. But let me share this with you. He prepared a place a long time before this. This going after God thing with David didn't start right then. This, this purposeful heart to, to go to the present, it did not start at this moment when he became king. It started when nobody was around. It started when he was in a secret place. It started with, when he was with some sheep on the backside of the desert, uh, songwriting and writing music and worshiping and getting skillful and practicing and pouring out his heart to God and being a psalmist when nobody cared. He had already made a place in his life for the presence of God. Now he's king, and all he's doing is continuing to do what he's always done, but in a bigger way. And believers, what you do in secret prepares you for your future. What you do when nobody's watching and nobody cares prepares you for your future because you know what? God cares and God's watching, and what you do in secret qualifies you or disqualifies you for the presence. Come on. You know, I remember as a kid, uh, I was pretty shy, and um, I played the piano from the time I was about seven years old in response to your question at the car at Teen Challenge. All right, I was about seven years old. You're getting the answer 30 years later. All right. And for me, as time went on, and some of you who are musicians might understand this, um, it became a way for me to express the way I felt. So sometimes I would just sit there and play as a 14-year-old later on or as a 16-year-old, and I couldn't put into words what I wanted to say, but somehow I could play it with my hands. And I would take time just to play and write songs as a youth, as a teen. Hey, youth, God can use you in this place. Youth, just like David, God could be preparing you for what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And so I would play, and I'm telling you what, the presence of God would just kind of show up, even though I wasn't even trying to make that happen. I was just worshiping 
and God would show up. And I tell you what, that's what needs to happen because then when you step on a platform or you step in public, it isn't like you're trying to perform. It isn't like you're trying to make something happen. It's just what you do. And God shows up and says, oh, that's just us. That's just what we do all the time. And that's what happened with David. Listen, folks, if you'll prepare a place in private, a place where you meet God and God meets you, then in the moment when you're in public or you're in the platform or you're leading a life group, God will just meet you there, like I said, and say, this is our place. But it has to come in the secret place. Have you pitched a tent? in your life, through praise, through worship, through alone time with God? Have you made some room in your life? Have you cleared some land in your heart or in your life? Listen, folks, if we're gonna respond to that word today as it relates to worship, we better prepare a place for God's presence in our lives in a greater way. So David and his army, the whole house of Israel, they're praising God. They've got the ark, but they weren't necessarily really sure what to do with it, and they, I'm just going to tell you the story. They put it on this ox cart. They didn't really know how to handle the presence of God. Honestly, they were just doing the last way it had been seen when the Philistines put it on a cart and sent it back in. Now listen, we do not handle the presence of God in the world's way, and that's a whole other sermon. The oxen stumbled Yuza, this young man, reached out and touched the ark, also a whole other sermon we're going to get into, and he died on the spot. Man, you want to kill a worship party? The usher, bam, he's on the ground, he's dead. Love you, ushers, bless you, all right? So David freaks out. He says, I can't do this. This is too crazy. He says, let's leave it here. Let's leave it where we're at. Hey, Obed-Edom, he was a servant in the house of God. Take it to your house. I'm not touching it. David walked away. Only one problem. After three months, he noticed, whoa, Obed-Edom is so blessed. So blessed by the presence of God in his house. He said, I'm going back. And let me just say this. Sometimes in pressing into praise, pressing into God's presence, we might blow it or we might not understand what's going on all the time. But keep going after it. Persevere in praise. Persevere in going after the presence of God. How many times in the Psalms, like Psalms 13, does David say, How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Anybody ever been there before? Like, God, where are you? You know, you've heard it said, you throw your prayers up, it feels like they're coming down. And David went through that, but but you never see him stop praising. In fact, in that same chapter, chapter 13 of Psalms, as you go down, he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Even in the times where you don't understand, you persevere based on the fact that God is good and you know he's looking out for you and he works all things together for your good, so you praise him. So David said, I'm going, I'm going back after that ark. He persevered. Yeah, he blew it. He messed up. He didn't handle it right. But he went back, and God's word said to have the Levites carry it. So now they start to carry it. And verse 13 of chapter 6 says, when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Now, I don't know if they did it one time, six steps, and killed it. It just seems a little weird that you would do that. The impression I have is that every six steps they sacrificed. I think David was like, I'm not taking any chances this time. (laughs) Every six steps we're going to sacrifice. You know what's really interesting? Six is the number of man, Revelation says. Man who's fallen, sinned, failed, messed up like David did. But Jesus, are you with me tonight? He became the sacrifice for sinful man, amen? And if we come to him and we repent, our sins are forgiven and we're washed clean. And all of this is just a picture of purity through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. And listen, folks, we're effectively 
in our personal lives and as a church going to bring the praise into our homes, our church, this world. We have to be living pure. We have to be right before God. And when we blow it, we repent. Amen? In the next verse, it says, David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might. The book of Revelation tells us that fine linen stands for righteous acts of the saints. In the Old Testament, we're being told right there that even by the clothes he wears, David is portraying that he was living a holy life before God. Everybody say purity. We have to have purity. And finally this, passion. David was a man who worshiped with passion. If you go back to verse 5, it says, David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs, with harps, with lyres, with tambourines, with sistrums, with cymbals, all kinds of instruments. That, that word right there, celebrating, that the Hebrew word is sakak, it means leaping, twirling, laughing. It literally means you're having like a praise party. Now, if you think any of that is somehow dishonoring to God, it wasn't dishonoring to God at all. This is exactly what they're doing, and, and it says they're doing it with all their might, not go to the left. That's not all your might. What, when you do something with all your might, you pour your all into it, don't you? Like, you're, I'm doing this thing. Like Pastor Daniel, the twirler. You twirl, I've seen you twirl. He does it with all his might. Come on, give him a hand. He doesn't do it for that. And it says they did it before the Lord, not before each other. It wasn't to impress the guy next to them. It wasn't, you know, hey, I can jump higher than you. You know what I mean? Or wow, that was weird, you know? Not that. They were just doing it before the Lord. And then if you jump over to verse 15, uh, 14, it says, David danced with all his might. This is the king. He danced with all his might while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord. They're heading into Jerusalem now with shouts. Everybody shout with shouts. Come on, shout. <laughs> And with the sound of trumpets, and David so into it, he starts throwing off his robes in all directions, and everybody's worshiping with passion. Now listen, that, that doesn't mean it's a license to go crazy in church and just do whatever you want, okay? There has to be order. All right. But he was leading it, right? And everybody else was responding to his leadership, and it was what God was doing at that moment, and no one was out of order. It was a wild and crazy praise party. And you know what it is? It's passion. It's God, I, I just have to worship you. God, you mean so much to me, I, I just gotta let it out. God, I so hunger and thirst for you that I want to do all I can to set out to usher you in, to, to help usher in your presence into my life, my home, this church. It's passion. I don't care what anybody thinks. Yes, I'm going to go with the flow of whatever, whatever is appropriate, and I'm not, I'm not up here to, to, to draw attention to myself and do something that, that's not the flow of the service, that's not how we operate, but in those moments where we can, you just give all you've got to the Lord. Passion. Do you have passion? When you walk into this place, are you passionate about touching God? Or, or is it just church as normal? Today, the video we saw said, we can't continue with the status quo. What kind of worshipers are we going to be? Are we going to be passionate, go after God worshipers? He was passionate, but you know, but you know who didn't have passion? His wife. 
If you keep reading this chapter, and I encourage you to go home and read it, she wasn't with the whole house worshiping. She wasn't focused on the Lord. In fact, it said, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city, this is the presence of God coming to the forefront of the nation. Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. She wasn't in the praise party. And when she saw King David, her husband, leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. This is a moment. This is a moment for Israel. A definitive moment, and she's not there. She's not even thinking about God's presence. God's presence has been out of the picture for years and years, and everybody's celebrating. It literally said the whole house, only she is mentioned up in a window watching. There was no passion, there was no purpose. There was no preparation for God in her life. There was no focus on God, just watching others be passionate. And let me tell you, if you're just a watcher and not a worshiper, it ends up being a criticism. Why wasn't she there? Can I just say this? Don't be a Michael. And the result of all this, the preparation, priority, all the things I mentioned, was that God brought prosperity. Listen for one moment. What did I say? Obed-Edom only had that ark in his house. We're pretending like it's over here, by the way. That's why I keep pointing over here. For three months, and he was so blessed that David's like, I'm going back. You get the presence of God in your life in greater measure, you are going to be blessed because God is prosperous, and he's showing up in your place. I mean, David, the wild praiser, after you read on in this, this chapter, it says that he blessed everyone, every single person who came. It's like the whole nation. He gave them a cake of uh, a raisin cake. He gave them blah, blah, blah. He gave them food every single. Listen, you don't give away food to an entire nation unless you got some money. And prosperity isn't all about just money. We prosper in our souls. Amen. There's lots of ways that we can prosper, but, but, but they were blessed. The worshipers were blessed. I mentioned Michael. You know what it says about her? The last verse of this chapter says, and Michael, daughter of Saul. Notice it didn't say wife of David. Come on. She's being associated with her dad who had no desire for God. Come on. She's being called daughter of Saul. The one who had no heart for God. And it says she had no children to the day of her death. So the watcher was not blessed. She was barren. So how do we bring in the praise? How do we usher in God's presence, guys? One, we make it priority. Is it priority to you? Do you even care? Two, uh, we must purpose to go after his presence. Three, we have to prepare a place for that in our life. Clear some land, pitch a tent, make room. We've got to persevere even when we don't understand maybe what's going on with God. We've got to keep our lives pure, and we've got to worship with passion. This chapter for, for me, I'm going to ask, Ben, would you guys come? This chapter for me has been like a hallmark for me as a worship leader and a worshiper. I've preached on it many times. I may have preached on it here before years ago in another fashion or another way. But I tell you what, Pastor Daniel mentioned, I had no idea he was going to say that. When I first came on this staff, whatever it was, 30-something years ago, 34 years ago, 22 years old, I told Pastor Morocco, yeah, I'll do the orchestra, yeah, I'll do the shows, yeah, I'll do this, but I won't lead worship. I don't do that. And he's like, okay. <laughs> then like about three months later, in staff meeting, he said, um, you're going to need to lead worship this Sunday. I'm like, I'm on the side going, we talked about this, remember? remember? He's like, yeah, 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 it's not going to work. All right. <laughs> he's like, 
Pastor Ken Sai has to go to Lanai. There's literally nobody else. Pastor Brian's in kids ministry. There's nobody else. You got to lead. If you get in trouble, I'll take over. And I grew up in a church where we sang three, you know, some hymns out of the book. I went to a college where we sang three hymns, and if we sang an extra 80s chorus at the end, we were getting really spiritual. I mean, like heaven was coming down or something. And even like the worship leaders would direct like a choir, right? We went to school together. <laughs> Haggerty's. I mean, it was pretty stiff. So then I go to this church that's pretty charismatic. Pastor Brian, if you know him, I used to call him, I don't know what I called him, the charismatic nut, I think, because he would jump all over the stage. That wasn't me. So I told Pastor Bronco I don't do that. So he said, well, you got to. So I did. I sang one song and he grabbed the mic and took over. And I was like, wow. I must have been really bad. It was at the skating rink, the days of the skating rink. One song. That was about my level of where I was at as a worshiper. And you know what? That might be where you're at. You're like, worship? I don't know, pastor. I'm not that passionate about it. But I started worshiping more and spending more time and learning how to draw close to God through worship. And that kind of continued in my life until 1995 when revival hit our church. And I'm sure you've heard people tell stories of it, but a worship leader came that week with Rodney Howard Brown, and, and, and I had known him in college. In fact, he was in our wedding. I couldn't believe that he was even there, Stacy Swally. And I don't know what happened, but that week an anointing hit me that had been on his life, and who I was as a worshiper completely changed. And I was sitting on the front row about where Easton is, and my son, who's now Pastor Dylan, was a tiny baby, and my wife had been taking care of him through the whole revival, and she's like, you know what? I'm tired of taking care of babies, and uh, as she falls on the floor, she hands him off to me. And that was awesome, and I took care of him, and then church was over, and I said, I don't want to leave here unless I get something from God. You know, sometimes it's that desperation for God that draws him, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's a promise. And you're just so hungry for God to touch your life and heal you and draw. Not even what he can do for you, just to be with him, just to hang out with him. There's nothing better than that in the whole world. I don't care what you come up with. Nothing. And I said, stood there and I said, God, I'm not leaving till I get something from you. And everybody was leaving except for the really drunk people on the floor, you know, in the Holy Ghost. And this thing in my head was throbbing from the book of Acts. He went jumping and leaping and praising God, jumping and leaping. It was pounding in my head and I was like, Jesus, I don't jump in church. Literally, I said that. I don't jump in church. Pounding, pounding, pounding in my head. And I was standing right there and, and, and I took one, one, one tiny little jump like this. The minute I did, the power of God hit me. I could not quit jumping. I was jumping and dancing all over. There were people in the back. I'm sure they thought I was crazy. My wife said I ended up in the balcony. I don't even remember that part. I don't. Man, and the people who are only the Sunday morning people, especially first service in Maui, I don't know how it is here, but first service in Maui, that, that didn't come to any of those meetings that showed up for church the next Sunday were like, what happened to our church? Because it was all out revival. And everybody was jumping and leaping and running around the building and telling you the truth. And then in 1999, Maybe four years later. Are you guys still with me? Am I okay? I was at my house. And I felt like God began to speak to me about that chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I felt like God was telling me, you know what? Get up before early morning prayer. Get up before then, and I want you just to worship in your house. 
and just dance before the Lord. I'm not a dancer. Just sing before you go to early morning prayer. And in 1999, I would just get up and start doing that. And I have to tell you, something shifted again in who I was just as a worshiper, not in front of people. Thank God nobody was there. And I would go to early morning prayer, and then I would get in my car, and I felt like God would tell me to drive. And I would, I would go on these drives literally up to Olinda before, before Doctor ever had his place up there, and just drive up on the mountain and park in the, in the mist and the rain and just talk to God. And I am telling you that God's honest truth. You can think I'm weird, but whatever, I don't know. It was like Jesus was riding in that car with me. And over and over, it was like he was there. And I would get in the car and whatever was in that seat, I would just move out of that seat and, and clear the seat. I would literally make room because I didn't want to miss that. And who I was as a worshiper and how I related to God changed. And, and, and it's, this is not about me. This is about what God was doing. I still get in the car and clear out that seat. And all I can say is that's just a picture of pitching a tent. That's just a picture of clearing some room. Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a drive and get my coffee for the next hour. There's space. In other words, there's space in my heart, and I'm here just to be with you. And I can't express this next thing very well. I don't even know if I should go there, but in 2013, these are just more markers in my life as a worshiper. I was in my dining room in Dallas, again, before early morning prayer, I think it was, when I lived in Dallas. And I, all I know is that on about August 17th, 2013, all I can say is this, Jesus showed up in my dining room beyond anything I could have ever imagined that God could be to me that's all I can say that's all I can explain I tell you what God knows exactly what you need and he will blow your mind have I lost you I think I lost you and, and, and just in personal knowing God my entire prayer life changed that day and you say, why are you saying all this? I say this to say that God wants to take us from glory to glory. He wants to take us to the next level and the next level and the next level. But we have to step out at some point. When I said, I don't want to lead worship, I, there was no choice. I was doing it. And suddenly, worship became the thing that I actually ended up being about maybe more than anything for a long period. And God wants to do that for you. If we will step into the ministry of ushering in the praise, he'll take you from glory to glory to glory and deeper and deeper and deeper. But we have to be committed to bringing his praise, to be in the thick of it, not to be in a window watching, but to worship. And I'll add this one more thing, Pastor Daniel. As a result, you'll prosper. There's a verse that is very impactful to me. It's Psalm 67, 5 and 6. May the peoples praise you, God. Oh, God, may the peoples praise you. Then, say it with me, then. Then the land will yield its harvest and God, our God, will bless us. God wants to give us the land. God wants to give us the harvest. But we have to bring in the praise. Would you stand with me? Just begin to pray if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just worship me. Hallelujah. Because you are worthy of it all. Lift your hands and sing. 
and you are worthy of it all oh, for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve come on set out for him tonight you are worthy of it all you are worthy you are worthy of it all yeah for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory How many of you say, I want, I want to be one who brings in the praise into our nation, into this world? Well, I wanted to invite you forward, but I don't know how I'm going to do that. Just keep your hands up. No, I, I really mean it. You want to grow in worship. This is not about pleasing anybody by lifting your hands. God's the one watching. Mm, yeah. So, Father, sweep through this place. This place has been a place of praise. This place has been a place of great expression. But, Lord, next level. Next level. God, I pray in personal lives right now, not, not even in this building, not even at this church, not even at a church function, but in personal lives right now, in homes, you would begin, Lord God, to pour out your presence and your spirit and people would get hungry and they would take a moment to worship you in the house. They would get up a little early to spend time with you and you would show up in ways and blow their mind beyond anything they could imagine. They'd make some room. They'd clear some space in their schedule. They'd clear the seat, whatever it is, Lord God, and you would begin to meet them and transform them. Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, 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 praise him. Lift your voice, let your voice arise, let your praise arise. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You're more than a conqueror. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So God, let your presence fill this place A fire. Raise up and release passionate worshipers in this place. People set out to usher in your presence who come to this house like I am going after God and nobody's stopping. 